Hello everybody, and welcome back to me, Chanel, and to part two of my school project videos. Today, we're going to be talking about rockets. Well, how rockets work more specifically, and even more specifically, how propellants for rockets work. You see, one day I found myself wondering how rocket fuels were different from day-to-day -day fuels such as gasoline and diesel. As a matter of fact, at first, I thought it was just because of how powerful they are in comparison to each other. But boy, was I wrong. There's actually quite a bit of physics and interesting chemistry behind what fuels go into a rocket's engine. As a little hint that some people, such as myself, have possibly forgotten, though I had mentioned it a little earlier, is that it's actually referred to as rocket propellant instead of fuel. I'll get into more of that in a minute, but first, for all of this to make sense, I'll have to quickly go over the basics with you. For starters, you might already understand what chemical reactions are, and you may also know that most of the chemical reactions performed in engines involve a combustion reaction. There are other reactions in certain engines that can help neutralize emissions made by the vehicle, but what's making the actual vehicle move is the energy produced by the combustion reaction. Here's an example of a combustion reaction. As you can see, the combusting material has to have oxygen present somewhere for the reaction to take place. Now if we quickly relate this back to a rocket, in outer space there is no oxygen. So how does it work? If you look at how a jet engine moves the plane, it's similar to that physically, but not chemically, since there's oxygen present where a jet engine is. So what rocket propellants do is they have the materials for combustion in one part of the engine while having an oxidizer to feed the oxygen into the reaction somewhere else. Of course, this is just the basics and there are many more designs than this. I'll go into more detail later, but I'm going to try to keep this information somewhat manageable for this video so that the people watching don't lose their minds. Now that rocket engines and fuel preferences have evolved over so much time, we're able to now look at the information gathered and I can present to you the different types of propellants and general physics behind rocketry with confidence. First, let's look into the different types of propellants and leave the general physics for later. The history of propellant research for rocket-like machines dates back to around the World War II era, but is also rumored to have started in around the 1920s, but no substantial evidence is presented from that time, so we're sticking to the World War II era. In this era, the research was more focused around the solid propellant aspect of rocketry. As seen in this image, solid-based propellants are heavily valued to be a great propellant for rockets within Earth's atmosphere, because most of them lack a separate oxidizer. The first solid propellant that worked for something rocket-like was made in 1942 by a chemist named John Parsons. Solid-based propellants at the time mainly used a fine aluminum powder as a fuel and ammonium perchlorate powder as as an oxidizing agent. The chemical mixture was first formed as a liquid, then cast into the correct shape, then churned into a rubbery-like solid, which is a pretty interesting process in my opinion. There are also gas and liquid propellants that were being researched and experimented during this time a little later and are used in various items, but the history is a bit vague when it comes to those fuel types since there were so many different contributors and projects going on during this same time period. However, liquid propellants are heavily valued as a go-to for space exploration because they end up being much cheaper in price and have good performance and efficiency. But of course, liquid propellants aren't without their disadvantages, such as the difficulty of storing them safely because of how reactive they are with common chemicals that are around us. They can also be extremely toxic to us, so we need to be careful when around them and handling them. 
The first rocket to successfully launch with a liquid fuel was in the mid-1950s by Pratt and Whitney for the Lockhead CL-400 Suntan Renaissance aircraft. A pretty exotic name. For the last propellant that I'll discuss, gas propellants, they usually involve compressed gas of some type, but because of the low density and high weight of the launch vessel, they aren't used in the modern era for space exploration, but I'll give you some example uses for them later. For now, the most powerful propellant that I could find through research and was tested had a mixture of lithium, fluorine, and hydrogen combined with an unspecified oxidizer for some reason. Though this was extremely powerful and reached a specific impulse of around 5,320 meters per second, it was incredibly complex and incredibly impractical. For instance, the hydrogen needed to be kept at almost absolute zero, being to negative 200 59 degrees celsius to keep the ingredients a liquid while also having the lithium be at 180 degrees celsius for god's sake not to mention how toxic and terrible for the environment this fuel would be but that's enough of that there you have it now that you know what propellants for rockets are and what the common types are we can go into a little detail on the physics now with rocketry everything has to be on point and I mean every single little aspect. You saw those equations from earlier, right? This isn't even a language at this point, but luckily I'm not going into the numbers and I'm just laying down the absolute basics here or else this video would be like over four hours long. Now for the rocket's launch, they need to make sure that the nozzle is properly proportioned and that the gas release is stable. As seen in this image, Having the hot gases aimed more towards the center can cause problems in the upward propulsion of the rocket. That isn't necessarily a nozzle problem, though. It would have to be fixed within the engine. With an underexpanded nozzle, the gases are being shot around instead of straight down, moving alongside the walls, which will create efficiency issues with the engine's upward propulsion. Now with this ideal example in the middle, without going into immense detail, Think of these hot gases being shot at the bottom as a platform you constantly jump off of to gain extra height. The massive amount of particles being shot out from the nozzle at the perfect spot create a lot of upward thrust, thus making the rocket accelerate. Then the rocket goes through its basic launch procedures that I believe most of you have seen, with the engines cutting off and falling back to the earth or in the ocean, and bada bing bada boom you're eventually in orbit. As a quick little detail to add, I find it really cool how when a rocket's engine is turned on you can barely see the actual flame, compared to maybe a campfire, since the fuel that they use is based with hydrogen and oxygen, they're much more transparent to the eyes, which is pretty neat. Now propellants aren't only just used for rockets though I've only talked about how they're used for rockets, they actually have a multitude of uses outside of them, such as gas propellants. They aren't used now for rocketry, but they're used for things like aerosol sprays, medicine, food and beverages, cosmetic, automotive material, and paint industries, so they get their fair share of uses outside of rockets. Solid propellants are also used outside of rockets in the form of bullets for firearms, these solid propellants, mainly consisting of ammonium perchlorate for an oxidizer and a fuel like aluminum. I think some of you out there may also be interested in how propellants are different from diesel and gasoline, so I might as well cover that before I cut the video out. So of course, both of these fuel types need to have oxygen present in the atmosphere to work properly. And the only real difference between diesel and gasoline is the efficiency of the diesel's compression ignition at the cost of more nitrogen oxide emissions. So yeah, you can't use traditional truck fuel for a rocket mister questionnaire out there. But anyways, I've got to end this video here because I'm getting past the 7th page of the script and the 4th page of my resource document without any more uncomplicated things to discuss. So I hope all of you have pulled at least some knowledge and information from this video, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, my fellow chemists. Bye-bye.